From the History Yogi podcast, this is Dave. Large numbers of Chinese men arrived in colonial Singapore to do domestic work in European households. They often worked under the supervision of white women who managed these households while their husbands took care of official business. Other Chinese men joined the local sex trade, servicing male European clients. Today, we speak to Aidin Quach, a graduate student from the University of British Columbia, on how gender, sexuality and power dynamics function in colonial Singapore society. Okay, thanks so much, Aidin, for joining us today. To start off, why did you decide to explore the role of Chinese servants in colonial Singapore? Thank you for the question. I think, yeah, I wasn't planning on studying Southeast Asia at all. And I started thinking in my undergraduate, as I was preparing to write the thesis, I was thinking, okay, my family is overseas Chinese. So my mom is Chinese, like overseas Chinese from Brunei. And then my dad is overseas Chinese from Vietnam. And I was thinking, okay, I have this familial connection to Southeast Asia, but I think the story of Chinese migration has been one that's been told before. And there's so much scholarship regarding that already. The story of Chinese migration of statless Chinese in Brunei, for example, that's something that's ongoing. That's something that there are scholars researching on. But what is my contribution to this field? And for me, my identity has always been an issue around, am I Chinese enough to consider myself Chinese? My family has been in Southeast Asia for generations. I'm not Southeast Asian enough to be Southeast Asian. Where do I fall in this issue of race and ethnicity. And I came across some documents and my supervisor, John Rosa, was talking about Chinese servants and how they renegotiate and were changing the way that they understood themselves within the, I guess, within the confines of Singapore and colonial Singapore. So that led me to a new, like, I suppose, a different way of thinking about my research thinking mostly around migration. So how do migrants negotiate and change their identities as they move across space and place? This is a primary question of mine. What is lost? So what do they have to give up as part of their identity when they move to a new place? What is renegotiated as a result of interactions with people in this new environment? And what is changed? And in my case, I wanted to look at masculinity as a as a male myself, I think that masculinity is a powerful force to like, even though it is a social construct, it is very ingrained in the way that we do things. I'm a dancer, I dance, and oftentimes gender and the way that I present my body is important when I'm on stage. So masculinity throughout my whole life has been an important aspect. So I wanted to see how notions of masculinity change with migration. It's also important to note that when we're talking about the study of migration, that the category of immigrant woman, immigrant man, immigrant Chinese doesn't mean so much and isn't elevated to significance until we consider a new location and a new locale. Before people started migrating, this category wasn't important. People moving into different spaces wasn't necessarily as important as it is when we talk about trans-Pacific or transnational migration. Another point of I guess, analysis for me and another point of attack for this question was around this idea of intimate labors. So the idea that intimate labors offer us a viewpoint into examining the colonial everyday. We have a lot of scholarship around like the political creation of Singapore. Um, We have raffles, we have this national narrative. But what do we know about the way people lived every single day in intimate labors and what I just when I mean by intimate labors is around the idea of people working as service jobs within the household or anything to do with like um, pleasure or the home, domestic affairs, domestic labor would also fall into intimate labors. They offer us a viewpoint into examining race, class, gender, and sexuality as something that's constantly being negotiated. So when a male servant is working with a female lady who is the head of the house, there is something being negotiated here. There's something being, there's a story being told here that is worth examining because those notions exist with us to this day. I guess my final tidbit, this is a really long answer to this question, is around the the idea of power. As a gender historian, as a sexuality historian, I am mostly concerned with power. Who holds it? 
who wields it and who makes power. Where is power generated and is it generative of something else? And how does this tie into our everyday relationships? So every relationship that we have in present day or even in the past is all about power. Your relationship with your coworker, your relationship with your boss, your relationship with your significant other, with your family members, these are all relationships of power and they can all be bottled down to these social constructions around gender. So that's kind of my answer to this question and why I think that Chinese servants are a great avenue in understanding power, Chinese migration, as well as intimate labor. Can you explain to us what the power dynamics were between male Chinese migrants and their male white masters? How did this hierarchy of masculinity function? So one way we can think about this is that we have to first consider one of the cornerstones of gender and sexuality history, which is that gender is a performance. It is done to help us affirm our position and identity. And it is also performative, that it telegraphs to others our position and identity to which they act and react accordingly. So, for example, when you think of performance, you might think of something that you wear clothing wise that helps me reaffirm my own identity as a male. But performative might mean like is an expansion of that. And it thinks about the series of effects that happen when I wear X clothing or, you know, certain type of clothing. And this is borrowed from, I'm sure you're aware, Judith Butler. Their scholarship is kind of the foreground for gender history and sexuality history. And I expand on that within my thesis and my writing by considering masculinity as a sphere of influence that grows with material and object possession. And within this conversation of material and object possession, certainly we can talk about property as something that men need to own. We can talk about a material objects such as like a vehicle or animals, for example. But we can also talk about people. And labor, being able to own and control people for labor is also a form of power and masculinity. So that's one avenue of understanding masculinity. Another avenue of understanding masculinity within the context of my writing, as I kind of look at it through primary documents, is how men were competing, or white men in particular, were competing with each other in this field of masculinity. So you know, there were there were men that were comparing each, with each other how many Chinese servants that they had. And if they had more, it made them more masculine in the eyes of their other colleagues or having a bigger house, all these other things. So there's constantly this edging of who has who is more masculine as a result of ownership over things that your domain, your household domain, if it expands, makes you more masculine. So in my thesis, I illustrate this by using like um, circles. So like circles that expand when we own more things and contract when we lose some things. In one primary document, we had in, um, there's a Malaysian in, there was a Malaysian uh, colonial officer. He was kind of in a bad situation where he was losing things. He had to sell his car and he had to sell all these material objects. But there was one thing that he wasn't willing to give up and he wasn't willing to give up his Chinese servants because that is the last thing that he wants his other colleagues to, you know, see as like a loss of manhood, that he's incapable of even the stewardship of his own home. So that's another avenue that I kind of explore in terms of masculinity. Another thing that we should consider is also masculinity in hierarchy, that people migrating into different spaces have their own understanding of masculinity and their own understandings of gender, for example. So Chinese understandings of masculinity, as I describe it in my thesis, revolve around this idea of the learned man, like the cultural man, who is an intellectual and an in, like a part of the literati, for example. And then also the man that is physically like has prowess and is able to do physical things. Within the colonial context of Singapore, you see that a lot of Chinese men believe that they no longer hold this intelligent, learned man or this literati kind of masculinity, that this has been subverted by white masculinity, as demonstrated by their colonial overlords, since they're mostly in service positions at the time. Um, The Chinese men are in service positions. So you see this hierarchy of masculinity, and you see that a lot of these Chinese servants are trying to emulate this white masculinity through photography. 
quite literally in the posturing of the way that they sit and pose in photography, you see this and the way that they dress. So that's another aspect of masculinity that I kind of discuss and explore in my writing and research. Now, many male Chinese servants worked in households under the supervision of white women. In what ways was this different from male supervision and what problems occurred? So one of the biggest changes for women, for white women at this time in colonial Singapore is that for the first time, for many of them, this is their first instance of having power in the colonial household. And this is unseen in Britain. In the colonies, women are expected to be part of the colonial effort and the colonizing effort. So when women start appearing in the colonial records in Singapore, you see them becoming heads of households and then the men starting to take on the office positions, the bureaucratic positions that they were originally designed to be stationed there for, that women were there to now have domain over the household. And this is something that there is like, there, there's not a lot of training for this for women in Britain. So you have a lot of these manuals coming out about how white women, you know, there's a language that they need to learn. There's a little bit of basic Malay that they need to learn, for example, in order to communicate with their servants. There's also these kind of advice pieces on how to control and rein in your servants as a woman, knowing that most of your servants, all your servants are likely men. And yes, so this develops as a new center of power in the household. And then this is also the in the backdrop, you have Chinese servants working together and collaborating with each other within the household for power and for influence. Suddenly, the most powerful servant in the household is the cookie or the chef, right? The person who is responsible for cooking and is usually in direct communication with the men or the, you know, the white woman in control. So you see that power is being reconfigured towards those that have the most intimate position with the overlord. And this overlord has changed in, in, like, in my thesis at that point. Like, but at the time of that part in my thesis, I'm talking about white women becoming centers of power. So the most intimate position of the chef is suddenly the focal point of power for Chinese servants and for most servants in the household. That includes the cleaners and everybody else who falls under the racial minority. There is also a difference in male supervision in so far as gender is now a bigger issue, right? By like gender being a woman in control. So this is something that's never happened before. On both ends of the spectrum, white men don't know what to expect from their spouses taking control of the household. Chinese men don't have never really been under the observation as well as the control of a white woman. So there's a lot of changing dynamics. There's a lot of rumors going around and there's a lot of hidden messaging that happens within the kitchen, for example, where there are messages hidden between servants in order to communicate things like food preferences by their masters and whether the wife is, you know, an abusive person or stuff like that. So you see a lot of, you see the larger development of this kind of hidden code and secret communication system within the colonial household. Beyond domestic servants, you also explore the world of Chinese male sex workers and their European male patrons. How did the male sex worker trade function in colonial Singapore? So they, we don't have a lot of primary documents about this. As far as I saw when I was doing field research in Singapore, and I spent four weeks looking in the archives, and it's it's kind of subvertly hidden insofar as the documents pertaining to sex trade often come about, and they talk about this generally, they just talk about the sex trade of children. They don't really make a distinction about boys. If anything, they make a distinction about girls. And some of the documents talk about how these children are shipped, their parents can't afford to raise them in China, so then they are shipped over to Singapore where they, you know, they start work in Kopitiam or other kind of avenues, theater troops, for example. And slowly as they age out of these businesses, they end up in the sex trade and in sex work. And it builds upon this larger narrative of sex work being one of the oldest professions in the world, right? So that's kind of how the sex trade and sex work started in Singapore. And you have 
this big urgency and this big concern from colonial elite about stopping the illegal trafficking of children. But they never explicitly say, oh, the sex trade, oh, the, the sex workers in Singapore are becoming a big hygiene issue. They don't necessarily make that explicit in their their transcriptions or anything, but it's heavily hinted that through children working in Kopitiam and theater troops that they end up in the sex trade and they end up in Geelong Street and that kind of story begins to emerge. In regards to Chinese male sex workers, there's also there was also a lot of notions around these Chinese male sex workers not being necessarily what we would consider masculine, so therefore not falling into the male gender. In Chinese, there's, you know, it, well, in the Chinese documents, they use a uh, nanjie, which is like a male sister. So they use kind of a more derogatory term to describe these people as not wholly male, not fully female, even though in many cases, these the, the, the sex workers in question were not what we would can now consider intersex or transgender individuals. It's mostly along the lines of there was, they didn't know how to socially categorize these people. So they just treated them as a lump set of outcasts. Yeah, that's kind of the premise of how I approached it. And then it kind of where I, my thesis kind of takes another step is looking at how this male sex work and male clients buying sex work actually evolves into this larger issue of along the lines of intimate labor, actually, that this subverts every form of power known in the colonies that men sleeping with men is just a violation of what is colonial power. The fact that a white man can buy a Chinese man for sex work or um, for sexual pleasure subverts everything that they've known, that it bounces off the idea that white colonial elite may not be in the moral high ground, so to speak, and that they might not have like the Christian morals that they are supposed to have in order to have the right to rule over everybody else. If we are to believe, like, you know, if, if I suppose like if they wanted to uphold the colonial narrative, white men have to be in the moral above and they have to be civilized. They have, they cannot be, they, there, there's no reason for them and they should not be intermingling with lower races and lower ethnic groups or minority groups for that fact. So that kind of violation, as I talk about in my thesis, as some scholars have started to point out, is kind of where we chart the origins of 377A. Stenton talks, um, Governor Stenton eventually realizes that so many of his colleagues, so many of his subordinates are sleeping with ethnic minority male sex workers, that it's becoming difficult to govern because it trivializes everything about the colony that a women may not be like, you know, women are not that important because there were, there are men that can provide sexual pleasure. It also subverts the fact that the white man is supposed to be morally above and, you know, is not going to intermingle with minority groups. And from a social aspect, it just, it kind of skews like the power dynamics that, you know, this powerful general, for example, or like a powerful colonial elite is desperate enough to have, or it needs to have sexual gratification that they're willing to go and find a sex worker. There's something about this that is subversive. There's something about this that is dangerous. And there's something about this that is in the minds of the colonial elite and Governor Stenton at the time, immoral. Just to be clear, you, you repeatedly mention ethnic minorities, but you mean you're referring to Asians, right? Yes, I'm. Uh, yes, I'm referring to Asians. So when we're thinking about Singapore, for example, it would be the Indian minority groups as well as Malay and Chinese. I just wanted to be, be clear because I think the Chinese would not be considered an ethnic minority. In That's true too. No, no, no. You're right. You're right. Yes. For clarification, any non-white groups non-white ethnicities. Now, you mentioned that intimacy between European men and male Asian sex workers became a serious issue for colonial administrators. How did they respond to this issue? So the initial response was around using hygiene as a cover-up. But this is, a, this is kind of a silly excuse or like a silly rationale, given that sexual transmitted diseases had existed prior to this supposed outbreak of male sex workers, 
there's plenty of scholarship that has been written about the fact that Chinese or like female sex workers in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and all the other all these other places were also, you know, they were there earlier, they were more prominent earlier, and they were spreading syphilis and all these other diseases. They, they were also spreading these diseases that it wasn't like to pit it as some simply something that male sex workers working with male clients were spreading is kind of a misnomer that it's not true. So that's kind of the first av- the first angle of attack. And of course, covertly, the critical issue is along the lines of this is, again, as I talked about earlier, it's a violation of all kinds of colonial power, that it's a subversion of racial hierarchy. It's a, it destroys gender binaries and it kind of ruins, you know, why did we bring women into Singapore and all these other critical issues around the colonial system? It kind of subverts everything. If men can have sex with men, then what was the point of bringing women or all these other things? And it just kind of trivializes everything. And it also problematizes another issue of colonial rule outside of the mainland. So for example, if we take British Empire, for example, it is kind of a slap in the face when the British Empire is not able to have a strong grasp over their colonies and their, you know, their governors and their colonial administrators are violating the tenets of the British Empire. And it kind of demonstrates how empire is the further you step away and the further you are from the homeland, from England or Britain in this case, that it is harder to control power. It's harder to exert power, especially when you consider that the tropics, as some scholars have noted, I'm thinking Anne Stoller, for example, have noted that the tropics were an attractive place for, you know, not very successful administrators in Britain, for example, to leave and go to because they were far, they were far enough away from the empire that nobody was breathing under, you know, over their back and that they could act out on some of their pleasures and they could, they had more power out there. They had power over the household. They had all these other things. So the tropics and the colonies became a playground for people to practice wielding power, whether in many cases that's that was harmful, it created harmful policies and created a, the legacy of colonialism as we see it today. So 377A, which has been in the news recently, has been circulating everywhere. 377A, as many other scholars, and I, I follow in line with some of them, or with many of them actually, they argue that 377A, while originally touted as a hygiene bill, very much, and the idea of gross indecency, that, that's one of the key words in um, the coding for 377A, that indecent exposure and indecent activities is um, banned and forbidden. It is about, like, the, the preface was about hygiene, but really what they're talking about is racial hygiene. They wanted the races of, in this case, Singapore, to remain in their own lane, stay in your own lane, the stratification of society was much more important to them in this case. Any like So 377A, yes, it's about stopping two consent, like two, two men from having sex. But more importantly, it was about making sure that this sex wasn't crossing racial boundaries. There is some documentation and we know like where there is evidence that say, gay sex was still happening but it just wasn't crossing racial boundaries. As long as it was kept under wraps and it was white men with white men, no problem. But they were trying to fight against this exoticism that existed. So that's kind of how the response came about. And that's kind of, and I think there was the Bombshell Rice article, I believe it was 2019, that was released where this was kind of the thesis for a lot of new scholarship to come out around what, is the value of 377A given that we now have these uncovered and accessible documents regarding uh, Governor Stanton's actual thoughts on 377A and why he decided to enact it in the, in the end. And the reality is religion was not that big of a deal necessarily. I think it was quite clear that there was no way you could stop somebody from it was impossible to enforce in the end, right? Just and this goes back to these concepts of it's it's crazy because um 
yeah, Foucault seems to pop up everywhere I go. But in the, you know, Foucault talks about in history of sexuality that even though something is banned, discourse around it, that its activity, that its existence doesn't just disappear as a result of that. So yes, even though 377A, you know, was enacted, we still know that gay sex still happens. And even before that, gay sex still happened before 377A and it happened after. So it was clear to colonial elites that you have a place, you have a position of power. This is part of our way of ensuring that power is not circumvented. Now, finally, what insights do you think we can learn from colonial history to understand current controversies over migrant workers, gender and sexuality? So regarding migrant workers, when Singapore, you know, when the white people left Singapore, the, the legacy of the household, the household structure, mm, we could argue hasn't changed much, right? When we think about the way that many households in Singapore now have you know, a nanny or a cleaner or another kind of domestic worker from abroad, we could argue that this is also a mirror of the way that white colonial elite also wanted to exert power over other people. What does this say about the modern day Singapore household? Or we could even expand to that and think about other colonial societies because this family household structure exists in Hong Kong as well in Malaysia, in all these other places where there was British influence. So in Hong Kong, there's plenty of news articles nowadays, and there's a lot of buzz around Filipino housekeeping uh, staff and cleaners and nannies being problematic, so to speak. That Filipino workers and domestic workers spread COVID easier has been on the news recently in, uh, in Hong Kong. So that is to say that migrant workers immigrant labor, the issues around that haven't escaped us, that we're still dealing with it as a critical issue. And that's something that we have to start, like the way that we can fix this is by addressing our colonial past. And that's part of the decolonizing process, right? Why do we treat domestic workers the way that we do now? And what does that say about the legacy of colonialism? in regards to the way that our family structures are created. In regards to gender and sexuality, I think 377A being repealed opens up a larger discussion and maybe we could even consider anxieties around issues of masculinity, issues of gender. So if men are allowed to have sex with men, what does this say about masculinity? When we like, it, we, we're so used to thinking about heteronormativity, like who is the man and who is the woman in the relationship, that now that it's legalized, can we begin to have a discussion as a community with our parents, with community leaders about what it means to have 377A repealed? And what does this mean about, what, what, what does this say about our society and the value of gender? Right. If we're moving towards a society that is not just about gender equi uh, uh, equality, but also gender equity, then certainly 377A is part of that discussion around what is the value of manhood in 2022 in Singapore? What is the value of womanhood? What is this category of woman? What does it mean to be a man in Singapore in 2022? And that certainly is an issue that is contentious. That's an issue that exists in many other places in the world. I, in, even in Canada, where I'm located, men are freaking out about the idea that women have the same amount of power as them. And you see this reflected in men con doing more violence towards minority groups. You see men doing more violence towards women. In the US, you have a lot more school shooters because they believe that if what it means to be a man is changing so fast that, you know, traditional ideas of manhood, like, you know, being a homeowner, being owning a car, having a, a spouse and, you know, having a female spouse in particular, if these things are being subvert, like subverted, then what does it mean to be a man? And then they resort to violence as a way to show off manhood in this crisis of masculinities. So 
3778 is part of this larger dialogue around what does it mean to be a man and what is what is gender in this world where everything is changing all the time and where does people where does everybody fit in into this new world that we're entering